I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. Hello, and welcome to Marketing Trends. This is producer Ben Wilson. Today's episode features an interview with Nancy Shaw, Senior Brand Marketing Manager at RB, a conglomerate that produces health, hygiene, and home products under well-known brands like Lysol, Mucinex, and Durex. On this episode, Nancy explains how she has been able to help RB's sexual well-being brands maintain their positions as category leaders in the face of stiff competition from insurgent brands. She also discusses the unique difficulties and opportunities of marketing sexual well-being products and how to break down silos between performance and brand marketing. This is a really insightful episode. A big thank you to Nancy for coming on the show. So without further ado, please enjoy this interview with Nancy Shaw. Marketing Trends is brought to you by Salesforce Pardot, B2B marketing automation on the world's number one CRM. Are you ready to take your B2B marketing to new heights? With Pardot, marketers can find and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI. Learn more by visiting pardot.com slash podcast, or click on the link in our show notes. Here is your host, Ian Faison. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And on the other line, Nancy, how's it going? Good. How are you? Things are great. Um, it's a great day, and we are really excited to talk to you. You reached out to us, um, gosh, that was months ago now. And since then, we've had a, a bunch of conversations. We're really excited to learn what you're doing at RB. So first, can you tell us a little bit about your role and the company, RB, that you work with? Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited to be part of this interview. Um, I love listening to marketing trends. I listen to it every single day. <laughs> yeah, so a little bit about me. I have been at RB for about three and a half years. I'm a senior brand manager on KY and Drex, which are our sexual well-being brands. Um, and my role is is a little bit of everything. So I do a lot of equity on driving long-term growth for our brands and for our consumer. And I also focus a lot of my time on being more digitalized for our brands from an e-commerce point of view, performance marketing point of view, and then also handle the day-to-day -day of a brand building, which includes P&L management, um, people development, and innovation, which I love that we're doing on our brands. So yeah, that's just a little bit about my current role. Yeah. And tell me about how you got into marketing. Yeah, it's actually a funny story. So I actually started off my career at finance at Johnson & Johnson. So I was at Johnson & Johnson for almost five years. And I started off in a regular financial analytical role focused on treasury and P&Ls, working for um, Depew Synthes, which is part of J&J. And while I was there, I, you know, I started to realize that I really wanted to go get my MBA. So I worked full-time at J&J, went to school part-time, and I got really interested from one of my professors who was teaching marketing strategy at that time. And it was so much about business development, understanding consumer needs, and really bringing new ideas into market that it really excited me. And since then, I, st I started to explore, you know, what does marketing really look like? What is brand management? Because when you go into school versus when you actually start working for an organization, marketing means so many different things. So you know, you could go into CMI research, you could go into brand management, you can go into trade marketing. So um, actually, after I finished my MBA, I moved into trade marketing roles at J&J on uh, brands like Neutrogena and Clean and Clear. And then I made the switch into brand management, which I absolutely love. So yeah, a little bit of a winded journey, but I absolutely love being in marketing and being able to really own a brand and drive the business. And tell me a little bit more about you know, the portfolio of brands that are, that make up RB. Uh, so the listeners kind of have an idea of kind of the scope of the company. Yeah, absolutely. So RB is actually, we have a lot of mainstream brands that most consumers are familiar with, like Lysol, Mucinex. We have KY and Durex. Durex is number one world condom brand. It's actually really, really big in other markets as well. So RB has a breadth of portfolio in VMS as well. So vitamin, minerals, and supplements, as we call it um, here. And it includes like shift vitamins. And we actually just launched Nureva. So it has a breadth of portfolio from household items like finished dishwashing detergent, Lysol, Mucinex, to healthcare items like 
Amalpay, which is for your foot care, via Clearcell, like beauty products. We have KY and Direx, like I mentioned. So it's a breadth of portfolio in the U.S. So let's get into talking about specifically what you're working on, marketing KY and Durex. What are some of the challenges that you face with this? You know, we talked to offline about this idea that, you know, condoms are still one of the most uh, shoplifted items at convenience stores, at, you know, Walgreens and all these other things. It's one of those things that people still feel, you know, whether it's ashamed or embarrassed or whatever it is to buy those things or having that interaction, which leads to this idea of people being able to buy online and all of this. Like, could you talk through some of the challenges that marketing these products have? Yeah, absolutely. And I can talk about it in two different ways. So, um, you know, KY is essentially a market leader when it comes to, comes to lubricants in the category. And then we have condoms, which is where Durex kind of plays a, a big role as a, as a world's number one condom brand. And some of the challenges that we're facing, both on lubes category and condoms, is just the taboo around these products. So when we think about the European market, it's actually pretty okay and normal to talk about sexual pleasure and to talk about lubricants and condoms. And if you see some of the marketing tactics that they're doing out there, it's so much different than how we target and talk to our consumers in the U.S. because of our conservative society. So one of the interesting things is, and not a good thing is that STI and STD rates are at an epidemic level in the United States. And that's one of the reasons behind is that consumers just don't see why they need to use a condom. And since the rise of emergency contraceptive and other methods, um, condoms have actually continuously declined in the market from a consumption point of view. So it's really hard for us to really think about how do we make condoms cool again, right? How do we talk about safety and the fact to avoid an STI and STD to these young Gen Z and millennial consumer, but at the same time, you're you know not trying to scare them. So it's finding that right balance when it comes to marketing our condoms brand. And the other challenge that we face on lubes, one of the interesting things um, is For example, we can advertise condoms on YouTube, but we can't talk about lubricants because lubricants is more for pleasure and condoms is more for safety. So which seems such a taboo to me because lubricants is such an essential part. It actually enhances a woman's pleasure because two thirds out of the month, woman is actually not optimally lubricated to have comfortable and pleasurable sex. So it's actually doctors recommended. So KY is actually number one doctor recommended brand. So for me, the purpose around KY is to really normalize loops and how do we make it an okay product for consumers to really talk about and think that it's it's um, a value add for them when they're thinking about their sexual pleasure. So there are two different challenges in both of these categories. And that's where I get really excited about because our marketing campaigns are around purpose-driven marketing. Yeah. And that's kind of where, you know, we can really target different consumers, come up with different comm strategy because with KY, it's very much focused on women, whereas in condoms, it's very much focused on Gen Zs and millennials. That's really interesting. So, and, and I want to circle back on the YouTube point. So, why can't I, I'm confused. Like, are you saying you can't do it because it doesn't work as well? Or are you saying like, like the platform doesn't allow you to do that? No, the, the platform itself will not allow us to talk about lubricants. And that I mean, if I can wild. just, <laughs> yeah, so we, we can talk about condoms, but we can't talk about lubes and it just seems, um, you know, bizarre for us for sure. And if I can just expand on that, some of the TV channels also are very much against talking about condoms and lubes in this category. And that's why, um, you know, you don't see a lot of commercials around condoms or lubes in the market, especially not in prime time or daytime. So that's, for us, it's really hard. And this is why we love digital. And that's why 70% of my budget when I talk about marketing is in digital is because I can do a lot more in digital than I can in TV uh, because of all these restrictions. So that is really wild about the levels in which you, you can and can't market Uh, especially to those mainstream platforms where a lot of brand marketers rely. I mean, most brand marketers that we talk to, I mean, TV, YouTube, uh, any type of video content is their bread and butter. What were some of those learnings that you, that you had, especially around 
evangelizing to the market because I think that you know there's so much education that you can do as part of this marketing that you do do. I'm really excited to to learn more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know we realized quickly that it's going to be really tough for us to crack this without having a very purpose driven. Um, brand message to our consumers and to our media partners. So what we actually did for KY is we completely rebranded our purpose and we, you know, we changed from a KY, just to give you a quick background, KY has been around for a hundred years. So for us to really think about how do we keep this brand alive for the next hundred years, we needed to find that purpose and what KY really stands for. So the new campaign that we just came out with is called Get What You Want. And part of the campaign, we actually did a docu-series with finding uh, women across the United States and talking about their sexual pleasure and some of the issues that they faced. And it's, it's, you know, it's on our YouTube Live right now. And it's, it's fascinating that these women had no education about their pleasure. And you know, most of the consumers today actually watch a lot of porn and that's where they get a lot of their education around sex versus, you know, where we could, could actually start at school. And it, it was interesting. One of the consumer was mentioning in the document series was in schools, what we talk about is abstinence, that you shouldn't have sex. And we know most teenagers are actually very sexually active. And when teenagers are sexually active, they don't understand that you know, you have just as much of a right to a pleasure as much as a man does. But what does that look like? What does that mean for you? And if you're experiencing, um, you know, pain during sex, what can you do to make it better for yourself? And and how can your partner help you? So these kind of questions is what we're trying to really address. And it was fascinating that there are so many women who want to talk about this, but they just don't have the platform to talk about it. And we wanted to be that brand who kind of brings that to the forefront. And, you know, we did a big launch around it and it's gotten a really good traction. We had um, great engagement on Twitter and Instagram and so many consumers thanking us for kind of normalizing this. And it's okay to ask for all of these questions. And hopefully, you know, we have a brand that can address all of these through our products. It's pretty remarkable that to have the impact that you want to have you have to make the content yourself right like that the that the restrictions that you have around advertising kind of forces you into content marketing usually it's kind of the other way right it's like marketers are kind of realizing like hey i could have i want to control the narrative a little bit better i want to empower creators i want to create something meaningful and lasting um in the world that lasts you know beyond a 30 second spot um whereas you were kind of you know a little bit forced into that but did you kind of feel that it was liberating to be able to help actually shape the narrative and, and create something that gets so much of the conversation started or you know gets that type of feedback like what did it feel like to get get those messages from from women who listened and, and watched the content yeah i mean to be very honest with you it feels it felt really good to kind of bring this to a spotlight and in us specifically because if you think back like a year or two we were talking about the me too movement um and if you think about what's happening in you know outside of our ca- category and brands like on netflix there's a a series on sex education and these are essentially high school kids who are talking about all these things you know it, it just it was kind of really great from a brand perspective that we are able to bring some shed some light and have consumers really speak about this openly so that we can support them but also it was kind of like aren't we kind of too late on this like shouldn't we already be doing this years ago um you know the fact that there's the whole movement around this like why why aren't we talking about positive things around sexual experiences and only the negative Um, And that's kind of, you know, why I feel really good about where the brand is really headed. And if I can just expand on that a little bit, you know, because of all these restrictions, I always look at the positive and the positive that came out of it was that we became a very digitally focused brand and we started to create our own content, which was great. One of the examples that I can share with you is, you know, Durex was part of a MTV Spring Break partnership. And we literally went there as brand marketers and we talked to our consumers and we took some footage literally on our iPhone. And, you know, we obviously went through all the 
hoops that we needed to do uh, internally. And we put that content up on our social media with some paid behind it on Instagram. And it got such great engagement, almost three times more engagement than a content that we would have created, you know, through an agency. Yeah. Um, so I think we started to realize that there's definitely a space for us to bring some light and, and have a voice of our own, but also listen to our consumers. And what they really want to talk about is all of these things that we as a brand want to talk about. So why don't we just give them a platform and our platform is our, uh, through our social media. So, you know, we're, we're creatively finding new ways outside of these challenges that we're facing from, you know, other media channels, but then focusing on digitally. And that's, I think, where my love for performance marketing came in as well, because as we are starting to gather, we'll become more digital, gather more data, we are actually be able to make more informative decisions based on the data and the science. Yeah, I mean, I look at some of the brilliant content or shows or podcasts or things like that where you have, I mean, you think like Chelsea Handler is a great example of someone who was a creator, had a singular vision of something that we she wanted to write and create. Her experiences, I think, resonated with a lot of people. And it's just something where like she had the platform to be able to you know, create what she wanted to create and tell her life uh, in a way that might resonate with other people. I think that with how we're creating content now, we're at the cutting edge of brands being able to empower creators to tell those stories. But at the end of the day, we need to measure and we need to figure out how to drive business results. How do you kind of like toe that line of Yo, know, anecdotally, this stuff works. Like we're getting great feedback from women that are saying, Thank you for making this. I wanted to see this. This is great. Engagement is higher on social. But how does it ultimately go back to performance marketing and prove that the spend actually shows the ROI that, that you were going for? Yeah, um, that's such a great question. And that's, I think, something I constantly struggle with. The way I've approached this is in phases. So when we, we started off doing a lot of performance marketing through our search strategy. So, you know, it's so much easier for us to understand Google search and it's honestly something we can do on our own. Um, you know, anyone can have their own website and understand how the search behavior is coming through. And we have really great partners at Google who help us understand that. And we just started to test and learn, Ian, honestly. We just said, all right, let's try to figure out some keywords that we can really work with um, that has the largest share of voice that can really drive traffic to our D2C site. And part of all of these thinking and going digital was also kind of educating the business to say, look, if we want to be an insurgent kind of brand and start to think of it that way, we need to test and learn more. And we need to have a robust data and analytics piece so that we can have a better understanding of what's working in our media, what's not working. So one of the things that we did is try to uh, test and learn search, drive traffic to our D2C site where we can capture a lot more data, understand the consumer journey, and better inform our media buys and better inform our content strategy. So, you know, to give you an example, we created an article on our site about spicing up your sex life. And it was just purely based on the Google search and keywords that we we're seeing um, during certain time periods of the, of the year. And because of that content being on our art, on our website, we started to get so much organic traffic. And that organic traffic resulted in, you know, a month of more users coming to our site, but then eventually translated into sales because we had a clear strategy on what consumers looking for. We created content for them on our website. And then the content was, you hope that it's good enough that it actually convinces them to buy. And that's what actually started to happen. And the interesting thing with our brands is that, you know, we're obviously available on most of the dot-com sites like Amazon and Walmart and Target. But the thing is, discretion is key in this category. So if you think about consumer, right? I mean, everyone has an Amazon account. Most of them have Prime account. I think now it's like 80% of the consumers have Prime account, but they're sharing it with their family. So now your older 21 year old who wants to buy condoms and he knows he can get it, you know, faster from Amazon and maybe a larger pack. And maybe it's also 
better in pricing, but now he's not going to buy it on Amazon and he probably wants to go to Walmart in store because of discretion. But what if he buys it from our D2C site? And, you know, what if he gets that discretion and we have technology in our sites of it that, you know, the credit card doesn't actually show up that it's from KY. So things like that is what we started to explore so that we can have a better experience for our consumer. I love that idea. And I think it also gets into one of the things that, you know, we want to talk to you about, which is the fighting insurgent brands. These newer brands are focusing, some of them exclusively uh, direct to consumer. Um, It's their, you know, their entire model. They have the discrete packaging, which you and I talked about in our, in our prep call, they have ways to try to meet people more than halfway to not feel, you know, embarrassed or things like that. And I think, you know, understanding that change is not going to happen overnight, um, that some of the large sweeping changes uh, are not going to happen overnight. So you can meet them halfway on things like discrete packaging. What are the ways that you look at like, you know, meeting the consumer in a way that they want to engage with the product uh, in a way that, you know, feels natural and organic to the brand. You know, like you said, these brands that, uh, you know, KY's been around 100 years. So I think for me, the the three things that I look for in my brand strategy and long-term thinking is establishing this robust performance marketing piece, um, starting with search, but then expanding into, you know, Instagram and social media strategy and content strategy so we can really optimize on the go and have really clear learnings on what's converting, what's not converting. The phase two is really driving a lot more awareness and normalizing the category in itself because even though there are a lot more insurgent brands today, KY is still the leader in the lubricant category. So, you know, as a leader... I feel obligated to really try to figure out how to normalize this category in general. So, you know, through equity campaigns and through these docu-series, we're hoping to drive enough awareness so that we can drive normalization. And I think the third thing is innovation, right? So what insurgent brands are doing really well is understanding the unmet need in the market and really innovating quickly. And that's where, you know, working for a large organization, that's always a struggle because, Innovation can take, you know, a year or two years to really come into the market. And by that time, something else is out on the trend. So I think that's something that we're really trying to work better in. You know, to give you an example right now, within the lubricant category, oils is a big thing. And what's happening is within the sexual being, because it's lubricants is so dominated by female consumers, that they're treating lubricants and their female care like beauty. So interestingly, we're starting to see these trends around oils and, you know, exfoliators for their, um, you know, their vaginal care. And it's interesting because it's so much resonating with the beauty trends. So I always think back to like big brands like L'Oreal, who has been around for a really long time. And there's so many other beauty insurgents in the market. But what they're doing really well is investing in the right technology investing in you know the up and coming trends from a digital perspective so they have tons of influencers they they definitely have tv but you know they're spending a lot more in digital and the third thing is continuously innovating in their products and it, and that's kind of what i also want to see us doing in the future is to be ahead of this trend so that we can be here for longer yeah i mean i love that and it just what is so cool is that you have such a clear purpose and vision for this of, you know, making, you know, women and men's lives better. And I think that coming from that place, I think a lot of times CPG companies struggle with, you know, the purpose of what they're doing. And this is, you know, I mean, you could, you can just search Twitter right now and see all of the myriad of things that are going on around this. And it seems like as a company who's, you know, putting a product in front of people that really can, you know, change their life, that education is so important to that because like a lot of these, you know, new products that are coming out, people just, you know, don't know, or your, you know, family never talked about or, or whatever it is. What are some of the other things that like you can do to spread word of mouth? I mean, we always talk in the podcast that we had with G2 Crowd, you know, we talked about 90% of people making a make a buying decision that word of mouth 
in some way makes a difference, whether it's reviews or talking to other people. This is something where potentially you have no one to talk to this about. You don't want to talk to your mom or your sister or, you know, your friend or whatever it is because you might feel embarrassed um, or you don't want to talk to your, your, your friend or your dad or whatever it is. The, not a lot of people saying, hey, dad, what type of condoms do you use? Not something that potentially people would talk about. But influencers do potentially or could potentially talk about this. Um, you know, celebrities could potentially talk about this. There's people from, you know, that have large areas of influence that could, you know, shed light to this. How do you look at spreading word of mouth in a way that is somewhat structured in messaging so that you can kind of, you know, drive the results? You know, the way I, I've been trying to do this for both of the brands is to look at it in three ways. So if one is really trying to normalize this and have a lot more education around this. And that's where our content strategy really comes into place. So, you know, what we're trying to do uh, is um, when you go into Amazon and when you search our products, we want to make sure that there are right images on there. There's right insights on why this product might be helpful for you. If you go into scroll down and you see A plus and B plus content, it actually gives you a nice story behind what the brand really stands for. So, because we know, I think now it's like 80% of the searches start on Amazon. So it was really important for us to be, you know, very much education focused, but then also have the right content and messages in every single consumer journey touch point, whether it's Google, whether it's Amazon, whether it's other brick and click channels. So I think the first thing, like you said, exactly, it's educating them on, you know, what our products really do and what the brand really stands for. And I think the second thing is really being, you know, now millennials are also also very much digitally focused so my consumer ranges anywhere between the ages of you know 20 to 54 so how are you going to talk to all of these women at different touch points with different communication strategy and that's what i you know that's what we've been trying to do and actually test in digital and the biggest thing that we have done is just test and learn and we have different comp strategy for a menopausal woman who's experiencing, you know, hot flashes and who's having extremely painful sex and she actually needs lubricant versus someone who is having sex for the first time and they don't know what it actually feels like. And if this is, is pain really normal or should she not feel pain? How do we educate her and how do we talk to her from a digital perspective and comms perspective and which product would be right for her. You know, I worked on this project on entirely revamping both of our KY site and D2C site to actually look at the consumer journey through different life stages. And that's been kind of our, I, I would say like our pillar in every single decision that we've made, even when it comes to our innovation strategy. So uh, I think it's one pillar is education. Second pillar is really touching her at different life life stages and different life points. And the third is really continuing that conversation ongoing. Because a lot of times what happens is one year, two year, you have you find this purpose and you do a lot behind it. And then you kind of lose traction and then people forget about it. And in this digitally native consumer where they're thrown ads, like I think I forgot the stat, but it was like 20 ads that they see in a day or I think it's more. You know, how, how are they going to really remember your brand and remember your purpose? So we need to start start to think about continuing that conversation and making sure that we are really standing behind that pur purpose for a long term. And, you know, I had to present this out to our, our business and our management team to really figure out what does that look like digitally, but then what does that actually look like offline? Because yes, we are very digital. Yes, we are very much focused on e-commerce. That's where we really want to drive our growth. But offline is actually a lot of our opportunity as well because, you know, 90% of still my business is in offline. So how do we work with our retailers? How do we work with our buyers and, and really make them understand our purpose and make them fall in love with us and what we're trying to do? And it's really exciting to see how, you know, when we talk to a female buyer or, or retailers, they're like, oh my God, this category has had no refreshes in so many years. And it's kind of eye-opening that we haven't done it. And I'm glad that we are here, that we're talking about this. So it's also, you know, they love the fact that we're innovating in that space, but also we're keeping that digital mindset. So I think it's all of those things in combination. Yeah. And, you know, we talked a little bit before this about silos. What do you think leaders can do to break down silos? Because 
specifically around performance and brand. A lot of times it's like, well, brand does brand stuff and performance does performance stuff. And we'll, uh, we'll meet, you know, whatever on our weekly calls. And, and that's about it. Yeah, it's, it's so true, um, Ian, and that's actually how it works. And sometimes when I talk to my peers in other organizations and other CPG companies, that's actually how they're structured. And I absolutely think it's, it's just, it's hurting the business more than helping. Because as a marketer, as a 21st century marketer, you can't just think about your brand and your equity and your PR campaigns. You have to be able to measure it. And we should be doing that anyway, right? Performance marketing is all about making sure your campaigns are working for you and they're working harder for you and how can you quickly optimize and, and learn from it, right? So I think they, they really need to go hand in hand. And, you know, the way our teams are really structured is that e-commerce is kind of like a sales unit and then the brand is kind of the outside and they just support the sales. But it shouldn't be that. It should be super integrated because when we think about Amazon media and we have EMS and AMG campaigns in there, there are so many synergies between what works on Google versus what works on EMS and, you know, how do we optimize our Amazon campaigns through our media campaign? So there's so many synergies in there that even from a business point of view, I think they need to work together and they need to really figure out a structure that helps grow e-commerce, but also focuses on the brand strategy and what they're trying to do. So I think it's that balance between sales and also brand, because a lot of the things that I was kind of speaking about earlier, like docu-series, now that's a lot of investment, but in, the result doesn't come in a month or two. While, you know, when we think about e-commerce performance, you invest in AMS and you invest in Amazon, you tend to see your sales results in a weekly basis. So it's also setting some expectations for our management and leadership team to say, look, the objective of both of these things are different, but they work well together. And, you know, one of the things that I can share with you is what I did is to just create a quick funnel and educate the leadership team to say, when a consumer starts searching for something in Amazon, that actual thought in her, his or her mind comes from something else. So for example, when you have Valentine's Day, you see a huge spike in just KY as a brand because we're heavily advertising from an awareness point of view. And that search goes into Amazon and hence they lead to purchase. But it's really hard to track that, right? So from a performance marketing, all they see is that, oh yeah, the search happened, EMS campaign was live and we ended up in, result, in, in sales. But actually, that started much, much higher from a funnel perspective. So I think what leadership can also do is really understand that there's a role for both, that both can really drive our businesses, and really training marketers. And, and I think RB, last year, I was essentially the only lead on e-commerce and digital for a lot of the personal care brands on, on um, RB. And... I have learned tremendous amount and I think that's what, you know, the leadership really needs to recognize that once we give that platform to someone and let it actually give them the autonomy to test and learn, to work cross-functionally, to bring the teams together, it actually drives a lot more. And once they see that, they start to recognize it. And, you know, RB is very much focused on e-commerce and digital and we're actually training our marketers in, in June to really think of it that way. So I am a firm believer that it needs to be, it can't be siloed. We need to really work together on this. Funny question. It's not that funny, but how much search traffic do you think gets siphoned by the fact that people now search for Kylie Jenner, which is like 6 million people a month, and it starts with KY? Because I was thinking about that when we were doing prep, because I'm like, man, so many people search for KY a month. And then I typed KY into my search browser and I was like, first thing that comes up is <laughs> Kylie Jenner. And I was looking at that search term. I was like, man, it's that's actually, and it's actually expensive. That's the crazy thing. Kylie Jenner's name is an expensive search term. Um, Maybe that could be another test and learn we could do. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, buying against that. Um, hey, Kylie Jenner, if you're listening, um, we have a sponsorship opportunity for you. Just let us know. We would love that. Your final question here, what are you excited about for the future? Like, what are, what are the things that, you know, you want to do that are bigger, cooler, or just stuff that, that really fires you up about the future of marketing and, and where, where some of these really cool brands are, are going? Yeah. Um, you know, I get super excited about 
so as I said, like my background is in finance. So I love data and I love P&Ls and I love to be able to drive a business. And I think I get super excited about how I can really, you know, digitize my brands in the future and really understand my consumer in a very authentic way and, and something that I can do myself. And I think that's what gets me really excited. And, you know, seeing see some of these cool brands, uh, I was just actually reading about Freshly the other day, how, um, you know, they found this unmet need in the market where, you know, you're a single person in New York City and you don't want to go grocery shopping or you don't have time to, but you want to have healthier meals, but you don't want to actually cook. All right, there is an answer for you. And they have this completely digital model around um, reaching out to your consumers and, and having that product that really resonates with them. So I think for me, what I get really excited about is brand building and brand strategy, but also how can we make it more digital so that as a brand and as a brand marketer, I'm much closer to my consumer and I really understand what they're thinking is so I can innovate better, I can market them uh, better, and, and that's what really gets me excited. Let's get into the lightning round. Fast and easy questions, just like marketing automation with Pardot. You can go to pardot.com slash podcast to learn more about B2B marketing with the world's number one CRM. We love Pardot. You will too. Check it out. Fast and easy questions for the lightning rounds. What app are you using on your phone that is the most fun? I use like Venmo a lot. I love Venmo. Um, we do yeah. a, lot of, a lot of work lunches and I don't know if that's really fun, but I love like reading comments afterwards when people go for like happy hour and they make like these cool margarita emojis and like someone actually like puking i just find it really funny <laughs> that is great favorite vacation spot alaska i have to say alaska is absolutely beautiful if you haven't been there it is you know we live in like new york city so for me to just get away and and be around like i think seaward i don't know if you've ever been there but like Anchorage and all of these places are absolutely beautiful, surrounded by mountains and ocean, and it's such a nice getaway. Yeah, I love Alaska. I have not been. I would love to go. I'll be next next on my list. What ad campaign have you seen recently that you're most jealous of? Okay, so it's interesting because I work on two different brands, Durex and KY, and I constantly struggle with this because Durex always goes to these fun parties. Um, so we are doing actually a Vegas. <laughs> party um, because we're targeting to Gen Z and millennials and I get super jealous because I'm like, why can't I do that on KY? And I want to go to these cool, fun uh, pool parties. We're actually going to be a part of Bonnaroo Festival. And uh, yeah, so I always constantly, um, you know, think about Durex and KY in that sense. But I think the other brand that I, I, you know, was really inspired by was also the Gillette campaign. I don't know if you've yeah. had a chance to look at it, but I think that was also one of the things that I also think about as a, a brand that I'm working on, which is very women's focused, but then how are we raising our men? And I was kind of a je jealous about how Gillette really came about it, but I thought it was brilliant. What is your favorite book or podcast that you've read or listened to recently? It's obviously marketing trends. Um, <laughs> Other than marketing trends. Thank you though. I, uh, I have so many podcasts that I listen to, but I love HBR. Um, and I actually just uh, got my book on how finance works from Mihir Desai, who is the uh, professor at HBR. And he's talking about how we're continuously investing and thinking about these small insurgent brands, like, you know, what happened in Uber recently, but how are we actually evaluating these companies? So I actually just started reading that. What is the question that I have not asked you that you wish you were asked more often? I think I, I always get asked, which I, I also don't know the answer to, but, you know, from a career wise, where would I see myself going? Because I love performance marketing. I love e-commerce. I really, and, but I also love brand marketing. And right now there's really, if you look in the market, place from a career perspective they're so siloed and they're so different and there's not one role that combines it all unless you go to you know an insurgent brand or startup so i think i would love to i always ponder on this like what does that look like in the future what does talent look like for for an organization in the future 
then do, don't we all need to be well versed in e-commerce if that's where you know we're all headed so yeah I wish you kind of had asked me that <laughs> I always talk to my mentors about, you know, what does that look like for a marketer like me who loves brand building and who understands brand management and really working cross-functionally with like supply and R&D and all of these things. But then also I see my passion is in digital and my passion is growing business online. So how does that fit into an organization? And, you know, I, I don't think there's, I have yet to find an answer on that, but it's something that always excites me and, and makes me want to think about it. Nancy, this has been awesome. You've been generous with your time. I think this has just been a really informative conversation. Uh, I think it's something that, you know, a lot of people struggle to talk about in their homes and it's cool to hear what you're doing specifically, you know, with, with KY and directs to heighten the conversation and to get people, you know, information that they really need when they need it. So just thanks so much for the, for your work and for coming on the show. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Any final words, anything to plug? No, I just want to say thank you, Ian and Ben, um, both. Um, I know we tried to talk over the past couple of months, so I really appreciate your time as well. And yeah, and I'm really excited to hear more on what you can do on Marketing Trends. Thanks so much. Yeah, shout out producer Ben. Great work. And Jonah and everybody on the team. Talk soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Marketing Trends. Marketing Trends is brought to you by Salesforce Pardot. World-class B2B marketers use Pardot to generate and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI at every stage of the sales cycle. Empower your marketing team to become revenue-generating superheroes and let Pardot's data analysis keep an eye on the bottom line. Learn more by visiting pardot.com podcast or click on the link in our show notes.